All right, good afternoon everyone. Welcome back to this week's lecture of advanced C++. Today we're continuing with still the very basics um, and we'll see today hopefully everything that is really necessary to know about functions and arrays. And we'll immediately get started with functions. I'm hoping that everybody already knows a lot about those functions. Um, the point of functions is that you have uh, code that you often have to reuse. And in the very old days, programming languages then were able or would provide ways to jump to a different part in memory where you would have then codes that would solve one specific thing and then afterwards you should jump back to your original routine. And then this became or evolved into functions. So if you have uh, a function, you can kind of perform one particular task with a couple of statements that follow each other. And those statements typically are then reused and reused again. So you don't use that much memory. You don't have to copy paste the same codes uh, all the time over your entire code. You just use it once and that's it. It comes at a certain price though, more about it later. So if you, in your program, often need uh, to calculate the maximum, you can just create um, a, a block, for instance, that says if A is uh, bigger than B, then the maximum is A, otherwise it's, it's B. So this block is basically something that belongs together. That is the easiest way of putting code that belongs together into, um, into its own niche. And we've seen already, if you have a variable in this block, and this block ends, then this variable disappears. Um, that, that, is, that is quite important to know and to remember. Now for functions, you can declare a function by giving it a name, that is in this case maximum, giving it a return value, in this case an integer, and giving it parameters. Sometimes no parameter, sometimes one, or sometimes multiple. Like in this case, two integers a and b. Those are given a name, so as soon as you come into the block of this function, you know that you're already having two integers available to you with the values a and b. And you do exactly the same, and this is now a function that you can call from anywhere else in your program where this function is valid. And then as soon as you go and call this function, it jumps to this block and executes what is in there. That's, I hope, fairly simple. And we've already seen a function, namely the main function. That is the function that an executable takes and that it jumps to immediately. And it returns an integer, which can be used, then, for instance, as an error value for the operating system. Okay. So here's um, an example. So whenever you have a function defined, declared and defined, that's the draw line function over here, which has a symbol and which has a particular length, uh, we can define what needs to be done. So our draw line function draws a line. So the name of that function is already pretty good, I would say. And it doesn't do anything. And as you can see, the return type of this function is slightly different, something that we haven't officially seen yet, avoid. More about that later as well. And we, um, in this case, output to the console, to the terminal, um, a particular symbol uh, length times. So in this case, 25 times, we print the minus symbol and then go to the next line. That's easy, right? So if we then, in our program, want to use this function, we can call it, and we can call it multiple times. Uh, so in this case, um, draw a line uh, without any parameters is writing this 25 times. Draw a line with a 50, writes it 50 times, and draw a line with an equal sign and a 9, writes 9 times the equal sign. And that already shows you what you can do with a function and default parameters. So the default parameters are the assignments inside the parameter or in, inside the signature of the function. Um, there you will see that it basically is possible to give them automatically a value when you assign them. And as soon as you call that function and you are in that function, you have to your availability those two variables in this case, the symbol and the length variable or len variable. And um, what we uh, will see, but also what I can say already, is that these default parameters go from the right to the left. So you can't have uh, a particular, or you can't have any uh, um, parameter being a default and any other not being a default or not having a default value. You need to be a bit, a bit careful, but that is kind of the, the power of a function. Um, interesting is also that within functions, you can also call other functions, and you can do this remotely. So, so that is something that functions um, can do, and is a little bit uh, uh, further um, from the or original procedures that I was earlier talking about. 
So if you have a function A and if you have a function B declared that do a certain thing, and you implement them later, you are able to call them uh, inside those functions. And only that way. You can't immediately implement or declare and then define those functions. So leaving out the first two lines here, int A uh, brackets, in B brackets, that would not be possible. But like this, uh, C++ knows as soon as you define then, uh, what is happening in the function A, it is possible to call A function B. Right? And this would, uh, would indeed work. And if you compile this and execute it, it will basically say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, endlessly. Uh, we'll see later also that functions um, can be given as arguments to functions, which is a little bit more uh, exotic, but also that has um, a lot of uses. Right, so um, a function has parameters as we've already seen. So for our maximum, we had A and B. In this case, we have another uh, maximum function that does not calculate the function and return it, but that prints it to the console. So in this case, we print out uh, the maximum value between two integers that we give to the uh, function call and uh, the function call therefore doesn't return anything in this case and because of that we use voids. So void means nothing, right? And I'm sure most of you know void already um, and if you didn't, now you know. Uh, but you can always ask then a few deeper questions here. Is void a type? Who thinks void is a type? No one? Okay, about three people. So everybody else thinks void is not a type. Well, void is a type. And I linked a nice discussion there why this is the case. So it depends on what you, uh, how you define a type and how we have defined the type last week. Um, but you can consider this a type. That is not given to everything, but it actually does answer all the features of a type. A type uh, tells C++ what can be done, how this is interpreted, and what operators, or how it's uh, um, constructed. Uh, no, not constructed, how uh, the data is uh, ordered of a particular uh, piece in our memory, um, and also what the operators are, what uh, valued uh, operators there are. And for the voids, uh, there are no operators really that you can use. And then later when we look at uh, pointers, and for instance pointers to functions, uh, void comes back as something with extras. All right, very important is that uh, whenever you call a function, Basically, what is happening is that in memory somewhere, those integer, or this, um, in this case, the two integers of our function pop up suddenly. And as soon as we leave the function, those two integers are removed. And just like we saw with the block earlier and also last week. So in this case, we have our main function. We give the values to x and a in this case, which are two integers. And we give them, uh, they're immediately assigned a value. So here they are. And as soon as we go to our function, in our um, memory, and I'm not going to differentiate between heap or stack or you know, how this uh, works internally, it does not matter really. Um, we basically then have uh, whatever the function provides. The function provides, in this case, a return value, an integer. So that's what, what is happening over here. It provides also two integers that are the parameters of this function. So b and a. So b is 12, a is 11, because you pass, when you call the function here, a, as our parameter b, and x plus 1 as our parameter a, right? So in this case, a has the value 12, so 12 is passed and assigned to b over here, meaning b is a completely different integer in memory, which is more important for the next one, because a in this case becomes the value of x plus 1, so we take 10 plus 1 is 11, and this is copied into the value a over here. And this is very important where sometimes if you're fast enough or don't think uh, thoroughly enough, you make mistakes, things are copied and then put somewhere else in memory. And when we then go into this function and start executing the statements of this function, we are in this blue world and this red world is not existing anymore. Right? That is very important. So calling a function is jumping to a different block in memory. Think of it that way. And there you have your own variables. And as soon as you exit that function, all of those are gone. So basically, we now go into that function, right? Um, the, the parameters have been set, and we now calculate a, we recalculate a, um, 2 times b, b was um, 11, so 121 plus a times a, what was a? Um, 
to, to do. No, I'm uh, doing it the wrong way. Let me go back so I can see. So we basically have 2 times 12 um, is 24 plus uh, 11 times 11, which is 145, correct? Yes, correct. And uh, we return that plus 1. So 146 is then being returned. Now, as, as soon as we return from that function, we go back to our main function because we, we left over here. You know, so that is a feature. As soon as you call a function, it's called. Once it's done, it returns right there where it stopped before in our main function on this line over here. Um, and it goes into the return zero part. And you can see everything that we did in our function is gone, which is nice because we don't need it anymore. That makes sense. So our memory stays nice and clean. Um, and this is um, usually a very good thing um, if you don't want any me memory leaks. Okay, so that is what a, what a function does. And uh, what the important things are actually the memory management and the copying of the values that you just saw here. All right, so let's go and first do something practical um, that I'm continuing throughout the first two chapters here or the next two chapters. So in this case, I have uh, an NCURSE as a program. NCURSE is a way to um, draw in a text window, so to say, in a console. And there I have this very, very short program. It's basically uh, writing this ampersand that you oversee here at the position x, uh, y, so at uh, position 10, 5 on the screen. In the beginning, it will initialize the screen, so it will empty it. And then afterwards, it will give the screen back. So that, that's what is... Um, first edition of what is going to become a maze game is. Um, and that's what we're going to do. If I can find the right window. There we go. Um, so this is exactly what we saw before, I hope. Um, and I hope I'm also in the right directory. Uh, yes, I am. Right, so if we want to uh, compile this, as we've seen, we basically um, uh, have our compiler. Can you read all everything? from the back, yes. Um, and we give this our, um, the name of our file. So in this case, it's may00.cpp, and we can compile this. This would typically already work if you're not doing very exotic things, but we are doing exotic things, as you can see. Um, several, in fact. So the, these errors are coming from the fact that we're using the NCURSES library, but it's not a standard one. Last week, we saw how to deal with that. So as part of the compiler options, we have to then link our NCURSES library inside our executable. So we have then NCURSES as our library that we link to our um, executable. So if we do that, then hopefully that will work. Another thing that we've seen is that if we want to build an executable with a certain name, we can immediately say minus O and give it that name, like for instance, maze. Right, so now we will build an executable maze and we will link the NCURSES library. Oh, the only thing that I forgot, however, is uh, that we are using auto, and as we saw last week, auto is a feature um, of a C standard that is a bit higher, at least 11 it says here. And how to do that? Well, also that we saw last time, so standard equals C++ 11 should then do the trick. Let's see. Yeah. So now in this case, we have somewhere an executable maze. There it is. And if we execute maze, we will then get hopefully what we expect exactly. So at position 10, 5, we have, uh, so x and y, we basically have now dr uh, drawn this ampersand and nothing else is happening. Because if you look at the program, um, so over here we have a while loop, as long as c is not q, and c in this case is the character that we're getting from the keyboard repeatedly, it will just redraw our ampersand over here. So as soon as I type here numbers, you will see them appear next to this ampersand. And those are the keys I'm pressing. But as soon as I press a Q, then I'm going back to uh, my original environment. I'm using NCURSE because it's such a simple first step in, in drawing things. Right? So that is the idea, uh, or that is the outset of this very, very small program. Now, I want to use uh, this as an illustration for functions. And I think it's a very good one because uh, as we are starting to create this program, it might get quite long. And let's test this. Because the first uh, assignment that we have here is that we need to move this character, this ampersand, around on the screen. We have most of this already there. We have our loop, our infinite loop. 
we type our key the whole time and depending on what value our key is, we can now go around, right? So we can, for instance, um, if we type uh, arrow up, arrow down, arrow left or arrow right, we can move this character because we have two, uh, we have two integers or two, probably they're going to be integers, we have x and y which can then be changed the whole time, right? So what do I do to make this moving happen? It's something we saw last week. It's something very basic. Yes? Switch. Excellent, thank you very much. So we'll use a switch on C. Uh, so basically, we basically now look at what the value of C is, and depending on several possibilities of C, we're going to change the X and the Y coordinates. So in this case, I'm going, well, I'm going to go for a S D W, so W for going up, S for going down, A for going left, and D for going right. C is a character, so um, when we basically use our C character, we can say if we have W, what we want to do is we want to go up. Up is basically the Y axis, and up means it's, uh, it's reduced. So one way to do that would be to say I minus minus, right? Or you could also say, um, if you want to make it really nice and readable, I is I, uh, uh, Y is Y minus 1, for instance, that would do exactly the same. Okay? And this is all we have to do if, a key, if the key W is being pressed. And as uh, a reminder, that's exactly what, uh, how we have to do this with a switch statement. We have to tell it to break for this particular option. And this we do for the next four uh, keys as well. So we have... A for going left, S for going down, and D go for going right. Now for going down, it's the opposite. You don't uh, uh, subtract something from Y, you add something to Y. So in this case, Y becomes Y plus 1, right? And for A going to the left, you have X is X minus 1. And for going right, you have X is X plus 1. That should be hopefully quite clear. Okay? A question, yes? Doesn't the keyword case Oh, thank you very much. And this shows that my coffee is not working yet. Excellent. So basically, yes, we, we need for a switch statement a case in front of the... Uh, and that should do it. Any other mistake I might have made? My precompilers are working. Yes? Uh, don't we need to clamp the values? Oh, yes. That's an excellent uh, 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 other remark. So in this case, x can become negative, y as well. And of course, they can go way beyond the screen. That is indeed true. So in this case, what would you do for that? Do an if test, right? So let's do that. Um, so if y, and then how do we do this the mo in the most elegantly way? Sorry? The ternary. Inside the assignment, we can go for that, yes. So basically, you could say <coughs> y equals, if y is bigger than 0, then you could still go to 0, uh, but that's okay, I guess. Then um, you, ex you, um, you get uh, y minus 1 back, and otherwise you get 0. For, uh, no, you get y, right? That's how you would do it. It's a little bit convoluted, but I like it. Um, and that you, you can do with everything. So basically also there for the, the bigger thing, you would need to know the screen size. Uh, we'll do that later. Um, but for X, you could do exactly the same, of course. So if X is bigger than zero, then you return X minus one, and otherwise you return X, right? That, that would be a good way to make sure you can't go up or you can't go left beyond the boundaries of the screen. Now, N curses deals with this. You can actually go into the negative columns or the negative rows. Um, it won't crash your program, but, you know, it is a possibility. Right, and you can see that our main function is getting already slightly bigger, right? Um, and therefore, it would make sense to split this up in certain things that we uh, repeat again and again and again. So what we could do is, for instance, um, do all the initialization in one function. So our main function becomes at least nicer and smaller. So we can say, for instance, we don't do anything that we return in this case, but we can say init is our initialization function. I don't think we'll need a parameter there, so we don't use a parameter. Uh, we also don't need a return statement if you use void. 
that's another thing. And then over there, we can um, do the initialization of our screen. Um, and we can do this uh, cursor set to zero so that we don't have that at least. Another thing that you saw earlier with, uh, when I executed is that whenever I typed a key, that key was also shown in our screen, right? So if I press G, you saw the G next to the, um, uh, to the at sign. That, don't, that was something we don't want, um, and that you can do with no echo. Um, these are basically standard functions in, no, in uh, N curses that you either know or you don't know, but you can easily look those things up. Another thing that we wanted to do was actually also add some color, right? And also there we need to first tell N curses that we need color. So, and that you can do with start color. And also there you need to initialize usually color pairs. This is something very specific to N curses, but um, that is the way things happen with any library. If you use a library, you need to know how those functions from the library or the functionality of the library works. Once you've read the reference, you should be able to know that, and then you can implement it as such. So we need an, uh, to initialize a pair, which we assign a certain integer, like a 1, a 2, 3, and so on. And then we can tell with certain uh, constants, which I think are colors. Oops, color. And then we can just give it a uh, color, like blue uh, on green. That would look a bit strange. Maybe let's do white. That would definitely uh, be good for a background, for instance. And then for our foreground, we can do red on black. Something like that. I mean, you can, you can choose any color you'd like, really. There's plenty of them. So now... We don't have to uh, write all of those over here in our main function. We just write in it and we call our function. Right? And we've abstracted part of our code. We kind of started dividing things up. In this case, it would make sense to do it because our main function is more visible and it fits on one screen again. Right? That is the nice thing, but that is also the only thing. Sometimes, however, you can do things because you need to repeatedly do that. And that is then something else. So, for instance, if you want to repeatedly um, say, Clear the screen. That is another thing we can do. Screen, not scream. Um, then we can uh, create another function called clear screen. Do I have a mistake? No? Okay. And also there, I can basically then uh, write a code for clearing a screen in one particular way. For instance, how do I clear the screen? The very dumb way, if I just have... Uh, this particular function, which is uh, the function to draw one character on the screen, I could do this with a nested four, right? And you should have, from your assignments, already seen how to do that, right? So I go for, um, we can do an auto here, um, our lines going from zero, and then there is this, um, yes? There is a mistake? No? Okay, I thought. There, were, there was a, a, a pre-compiler thing. So there is lines, which is available to you as the number of lines you have. So from zero to the number of lines, minus one really, um, we add line. And then for exactly the same, um, for our columns, so columns from zero, columns is smaller than um, calls, is basically in N curses what you get as the size of the screen in columns we also increment those. That's a traditional way to use a for loop. And then we use this MV add character function from n curses to then draw our, uh, an empty character, for instance. And you can see here how it's used. So basically, you use it with y and x. So that's exactly what we do here, except that we don't use y but lines, and we don't use x but calls, of course. And we use the empty character. So now we emptied our screen. So in our loop, our screen, whenever we press a key, is completely emptied again, and then we redraw our player character, right? So that is this add function over here. And then if we have this, we can move around the screen and we don't leave a trail, because otherwise our screen would not be redrawn. And therefore the old add sign would still be there. Yes? If you type the character with a space, wouldn't this be the space character and not the empty character? Or does it does, does not uh, differentiate between this? Because I know in Java, an mm -hmm. empty string is not a string with a space in it. Exactly, yes. So in this case, a character with a space is an actual space. I'm drawing spaces. 
which indeed, and you're absolutely right, is not an empty character. An empty character would have the value no, null, or it would be, uh, for instance, uh, backslash zero. That would be the actual empty character. If you go to the ASCII table, it's the first element at position zero. Absolutely right. So I should have set a space character, which in the ASCII table is in uh, space 32, right? So that's definitely an, uh, a difference. Yeah, very good. Was there anyone? Yeah. Yes, of course. Yes. And also the default case. We haven't written the and we haven't de written the default case. Well, if this if, is this bad in this case, not really. So in this case, we don't really need a default. What if it has any other tag other than the yeah, what happens then? That's a good question. It's undefined. But but the switch doesn't do anything. It basically does not go into any uh, of those cases, and then we continue from there. We could have added a default case here where something else is happening, of course, that is true. But other than that, I think it's not bad to have another default case here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool, so let's try that. So all of you had lots of time to see whether I made a mistake or not. So let's try to compile it again. Oops. Uh, I have lines and line. And no one noticed. Shame on you, too. Um, but of course, these are very small errors and very easy to, to miss. Let's try that again. OK, that works. Now let's see if I execute this and I go around, then my player character does go around, right? This is kind of fun already. All right, and if I press any other character, you don't see anything happening, so that doesn't matter. And if I press the Q, I go out of my game, right? So that's a fairly basic um, way. And what I've shown with this is that my functions are still short enough, right? They still fit into one very small screen, like main, clear screen, and init. And that way I can create anything, any functionality, and kind of divide it amongst multiple functions that call each other. And in this case, it's of course very simple. I just have a main function that calls these two functions, but, uh, uh, but later, of course, you're going to do this um, in a much more scaled up way. All the way until it really becomes uh, very cluttered, if you just use functional programming, of course. Right, back to our slides. Yes? How have you drawn the characters with the mods before this? Uh, the character, oh, this is a, oh, that's a very good question. So where did I have this? Here. So basically, as we know, in C++, uh, you do the exclamation mark and the equal sign. But my editor, as soon as I do this, is making a non-equal sign of this. This is not me, this is my editor, right? And, and the same for actually um, bigger than equal or smaller than equal. But a very good question, yes. So this is just the editor fixing things up for me, which often is very, very um, nice, but it sometimes also has very bad side effects. Any other questions? No? Okay, perfect. So now we went from this to something like this. I mean, here I uh, added a couple of other things. If I clear my screen, I actually use color. I didn't use color, oh dear. Uh, okay, but I gave you already uh, this uh, source code. It's in the slide, so you can try this at home. Do try this at home. Um, oh, and I also added here this draw function to have like an ability to draw anything everywhere. Because later we don't want to just draw our player as an add character, maybe we want to draw this uh, with a different character or we want to draw multiple things. Well, that is possible if you just abstract this to one particular function, with in this case four parameters. And these parameters have no defaults in this case, but you know we could have added a couple of defaults there as well. And then our main function, thanks to these three functions, stays nice and short and is just as readable as the previous version, which did not have color and which did not have a moving uh, at sign, so to say. Okay, so that is just a very, very basic first um, way to use functions and how functions can kind of um, make their code more readable and make things reusable. That's the idea. Now, also this should not be new to you, the fact that you can have recursive functions because functions can call functions means also that functions can call themselves. Um, and this is the very standard way of showing recursive functions, so the factorial has uh, a mathematical definition that is per se 
uh, recursive. So normally as a factorial, if you would program this, you would say if the factorial of 5, then you would do 5 times 4 times 3 times 2, right? And that's it. Um, but the nice mathematical definition in this case would be the factorial of 5 would be um, f 5 times 4, and then for 4 it would be 4 times 3, and then for 3 it would be th uh, 3 times 2, for 2 it would be 2 times 1, and for uh, 1 it would be uh, um, 1 times 0, and for 0 it would be 1, and then you go back to in the recursion. So for, even for a simple parameter like 5, you do a lot of function calling. And that is, um, in fact, not all, I mean, is it good or is it bad? You might ask. Well, every function call means that you reserve some space in memory, and you need this. You, know, you basically go for a context shift, and for there, every variable that you use, all this memory space that you use, basically builds up in memory. And that is one thing that is an, a disadvantage of uh, recursive functions. However, on the other hand, for many cases, recursive functions do actually uh, look more elegant and are nicer to deal with than with an iterative procedure. But that's something for computer scientists and, uh, and, and, and things that go on there. So <clears throat> for the factorial, this is how we can define a function. And the interesting bit is that this function calls itself, right? And if we see what happens again in the memory model, in the very basic simplified memory model, when we call the factorial of 3 as a double, uh, um, we basically then uh, go into this uh, function. That's what this over here is. The red thing is uh, this function's uh, memory zone. And then we have to eventually and also call factorial of 2 because for this if case, we go to the else. For this if case, we then re uh, go over here. And then we execute the factorial of 2, or three, the factorial of 3 minus 1. And for that, we have to call the factorial of 1. And for that, we have to call the factorial of 0. right? And then we are finally in the case here where we return the 1 over here. So this is being replaced by a 1, and n was 1, so we can have 1 again. Then we have 2 times 1, is basically 2. Then we have 2 times 3, whoops, too fast. Then we have 6, right? And as you can see, uh, this is just a very basic uh, stroy, uh, straw man type of uh, example. Typically, when you do this many, many, many times, you'll see that your memory starts you know, being filled very quickly, which would not happen if you would have a for loop here, of course. Right? That's as, uh, to give a little bit more insight there. Now, as I said already, whenever you call a function with parameters, what is put in those parameters is the value of the things that you provide if those are variables. So in this case, uh, we have the factorial of 3, uh, the double 3, the constant 3 uh, of, uh, of type double. Then in that case, that is, of course, the value 3. And that is, of course, then being put over here, copied over here. However, if this were to be in a main function, and you would have a double D, for instance, and you assign the double D the value 3 at some point, and then here, when calling the function, you say the factorial of d, then you don't uh, move the d variable to that function. You just copy its value and put that into the function. Right? And that's uh, what, uh, why people ca uh, call this call by value. So whenever you call a function, you copy the value of parameters that are being, or uh, variables that are being provided as parameters of the function, and those are being copied. So that is what is explained over here. Um, and that means we never, if we go into a function and we give the function when we call it a variable as a parameter, then that variable can never be changed. Now that is the disadvantage and that's why we have pointers in C++ and references. So that means whenever we have this, uh, again, a prototypical function uh, for swapping two variables, it does not really work, right? Because when we call swap over here for x and y, x being 5 and y being 10 in the main function, so the red block over here, we go into this blue block, and over here, x and y, as they are here, don't exist. We copy their values in here, but those are completely different variables that are being created. So when we uh, go into the swap function, we can actually swap those two, right? So in our temp, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a temporary variable, uh, we store x, 
Uh, then we store the value of y into x, and the value of our temporal goes to y, right? So we swapped those two values of x and y. And now that we did this, we exit the function, and what happens is then that our original x and y, which are two completely different parameters, or sorry, variables, are exactly the same. We did not change them, we did not swap them. Right? That's the, the typical way to think about copying by value. It, this is not allowed, or it doesn't do this, because we just copy the values of x and y. We didn't use the actual x and y uh, uh, variables. <coughs> Seconds. So one way to do this, for instance, if, is to use a return of a function. So in this case, we have a completely different case because here it is possible in the previous one. It would not be possible uh, up till now. So if we add 5 to a particular element, then we have here the function add 5 of x. We have two different x variables, just as in the previous slides. But since we return them, our original x plus 5, we return 15. And this 15 is being returned to our main function and then given to whatever um, the, the function call was. So instead of add 5x, we now place five there, uh, 15 there. And the, the value 15 is then assigned to our uh, variable x of our main function. Right? And that worked. So that is something or a way to, do, uh, to change things through a function. But up until now, that is the only thing that we've, uh, we've seen so far, right? So that is one way. And of course, it would be not very easy to do if you would have multiple that you would want to switch, uh, that you want to change. Like with switching, or how did we call it? Swapping uh, two variables, uh, values. So this would, in this case, be not possible here, because you can't return two integers yet. Okay, um, here's a couple of extras um, that I think are still very interesting to know. The first thing is inline functions, and that um, goes back to the fact that functions, whenever you call them, or whenever you use a function just for saving screen real estate, you know, whenever you want to keep things short and you want to factor things out out of the function that you're working with, uh, with a function, just like we did for the maze example, then you could have done this also with inline because you're not repeatedly calling this function. You just want your code to be a bit more readable. And you want you say, I have this init function and this is doing all the initialization of my screen for me, right? If you do this, you could have done this with an inline function. And the, the way to do this is put inline right in front of your function declaration and definition. Actually, the declaration and the definition are usually exactly the same or have to be the same for an inline function. Right? The difference is that uh, the compiler knows that this is now an inline function and that is only used usually once or uh, not that often. And it basically, in this case, does not do a function call as we saw before. It basically will copy your text or your statements as they are here exactly inside uh, where the function was called, which is completely different from the function calls that we saw in the earlier slides. Right? So this inline is a way to optimize your code and also a way to optimize um, um, the, or to also think about uh, your code a little bit differently. If you're using functions to uh, refactor things, then inline is often uh, a better way to do it. Yes? It's like defining a macro function. Exactly. So in good old C, you would have a macro function which would indeed do this as a preprocessor directive. Exactly. The difference is that this is a machine code, so this is not a preprocessor directive for those of you who already know the pound sign and then the macros that we've also seen last week in a very diminished form. Um, but I mean, this, this is exactly the same, but then optimized for a compiler. The compiler knows more in this case. Of course, you can also say most compilers nowadays are so good that they can automatically detect this already, right? So if you're inline, um, is a very simple uh, case like this one, and you use Maxima only once, then I'm very sure that your compiler is smart enough that it will do this already, uh, even without you noticing this. Right? So also that is something that um, where things are already happening, or many things are already happening automatically. Okay, so that is the, was that a question? No? Okay. Um, the other thing is overloading. Um, oh, there was a question, yes.
When would an, uh, what function be preferred? A what? A normal function, sorry. I thought you were going to say something um, uh, specific. No, a normal function is usually always preferred because that's, as we will see in just a few slides, typically is a lot more compatible with how we think about, for instance, uh, modules or also later classes uh, with methods. Um, so in that case, inline is not always necessary. However, for certain cases where you want to be absolutely sure that the compiler knows that you have something that fits really the inline scope in this case, you can provide inline as an extra keyword here, and then you help the compiler in making sure that your final code is more optimal, so to say. Yeah, But it also have, has repercussions. So inline is kind of also forcing the compiler to do it this way. And if you're, if you're calling your function a thousand times in your code uh, in different positions, then it will copy the same thing a thousand times in your code. That means the footprint of your executable will be bigger than as well. Unless also there, the compiler kind of optimizes for this. Yes, you had a question? Uh, I just wanted to ask the difference between inline and force inline. Force inline? Yeah. Right, that is, that is giving more uh, directions to the compiler. But that's something we won't see in this course. Yeah. But I mean, this is, this is again, it's, it's a, good, uh, a good question because it shows how many things are possible. But I think many of those things are really for the, the real control freaks um, or for very specific conditions where you really want to manage your, the footprint or the efficiency of your program in the, in the, the most details possible. Um, but I, I think that is, for most cases, like 99.99% .99 of the cases, not really necessary, I would say. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. So overloading functions is also a possibility. So in this case, we have our maximum function from before. But of course, you don't need to do this only with integers. You could also have other types of types. So integer, or a character, or a double. Um, and then for those functions, you need to also perhaps, or usually, also change the, the body of those functions because you suddenly have a different type. Later we'll see for other types that, you know, oper other operators uh, operate completely differently. So in this case, we have three uh, completely separate functions, but they have the same name. And in this case, they have also the same uh, return type. It does not have to happen. But since we now know auto, we can make it easy and say, they all have the same return type. Now, auto is not uh, um, possible to put as a parameter in those functions, right? So that is something that is um, not possible. And if you go before C++14, you can't even put auto as a return type of a function. But I would say it's in this case, or in many cases that we'll see, uh, quite handy. So therefore, I'm using it. But the point here is that we have three different functions that still exist that we can still call from anywhere in our code, and that whenever we call that function is derived from the signature of the function, or the parameters, the number of parameters, and the type of the parameters. And those two things are, by def are the defined, or the helper uh, for C++, um, to see which function we really meant. So if you provide two characters, the third function is going to be executed. If you provide two integers, and the first function is going to be um, uh, called, right? Even though all of those have the same name, and from the user point of view, whenever we call that function, we just have one maximum function that automatically, magically, is then uh, calculating the maximum of either an integer or a character or a double. This is overloading. Uh, sorry, yes, a question? But like before C++ was used, you have to define for overloading. Exactly, then you would have to, indeed, you have to here provide an integer, here a double, and here a character. No, no, you can actually have different return types for overloading functions. Yeah. Yes. Um, so basically, uh, I mean, the return type is what the function returns in any way, and that is, that is, um, that is not, not the most, I mean, basically you have to look at it from the compiler's point of view. The name is a tricky bit here because there's three functions with the same name. But C++ knows which name you are really talking about because of the type and the number of the arguments. In this case, we don't use a number. They're all, in all cases, two. But if you have, for instance, overloading of several functions where for one you have one integer and for the other you have two integers, there you would have then 
the defining uh, number of the arguments is then really what matters. Yeah. OK, and this is overloading, not overwriting. So basically here, uh, the overloading means uh, magically C++ is able to tell which maximum function you're dealing with. But also there, there are tricky things. Um, because you could give, for instance, a float uh, to this. And then the question is, which of those three functions is called? Hopefully the middle one. Um, but there is also there a set of rules or guidelines, no, not guidelines, rules that uh, C++ has. Uh, this overloading resolution rules. Um, the, those are these. But of course, also there, I think it's much easier to just say, um, stick to uh, specifically overloading the functions that you provide and then uh, remove all the others. How you can do that, we'll see in a second. Um, because also that it's the same with conversion. I would say explicit conversion or explicit overloading in this case is much more easier to understand and much more easier to read. Right? That, is, that is, I think, in the end, um, quite interesting. And to uh, prevent the wrong overload, you can use the equals delete keyword or addition or uh, suffix uh, to the um, declaration of a function. So if you say, I, I want my function to be only accepting integers and definitely not doubles, then you can add and overload a function with exactly the same name and signature, but you say equals delete, that's a good thing because you don't need to uh, implement that function from that point on, but also the compiler knows if the user is giving a double to this particular function, then I should uh, uh, throw an error. And it's a real error, a compilation error, meaning you did something that was never foreseen. You gave a double to a function uh, that actually wants an integer. Okay? And that way you can overcome also this implicit conversion of types. Somebody had a question? I think in the back you were first, or it was another question? Yes. Um, but what happens if you have, can you also use a default value? Yeah, that, a very good question. That's where it gets really, really tricky. Um, so no, I mean, basically the default value is basically allowing you to change the number of parameters that you call, which of course would make it for C++ impossible to know which function you really meant. So C++ will also throw there a compilation error if you use defaults that uh, mix uh, with the overloading. Yeah, excellent. Observation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, on the next slide with the delete, if I want to concatenate, for example, um, that I exactly want just integers and don't want doubles and floats and no characters, how can I concatenate them? Or do I always need to write and void my function yeah. in a basis <coughs> character equals delete? I might be lying now, but I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, I would say yes, you would need to do this for every type that's, uh, that is available there. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, it might be that there is some feature in, in a later version that allows this somehow to be grouped, but not as far as I know. Okay. Yeah. But of course, I mean, it means that you're getting a lot, I mean, yeah, sure, you need to uh, list this, but when you're uh, defining a function anyway, or overloading a function, you're s assuming that the user is going to use a particular set of types anyway. Um, and that might mean certain things and not other things. We'll see. I mean, but basically, it's, it's a play between um, type conversion, explicit or implicit, and uh, overloading. And as both of you are uh, correctly uh, already noti noticing, you know, that could lead to loads of troubles. And I, I would say the practical thing is to think in C++ compilation way, is if it's not possible to um, differentiate between those functions in that case, then it becomes automatically an error, um, sooner or later. Yeah. Okay. And then one more time about the default, because of course uh, the default parameters have then uh, um, a repercussion for, for instance, overloading. Um, but uh, what I still needed to say is that if you're uh, creating defaults, as we've seen already before with this right line function that we saw, if the defaults are given, they must start from the right. So the first parameter that you have 
um, is or, or the, no, the, the last parameter that you have can have the default and then you need to go from right to left to give defaults to your parameters. And also that has a reason because if they're all of the same type, like in this case, if they're all integers and you give them just my function eight, the compiler still needs to know which um, integer you're talking about, whether it's A or B. And here the, the, the definition is you start at the end. So if you give an A here, then it will be given to A and B will be assumed seven and will be given the default parameter. Okay, so you start from right to left and that's it. Okay, another thing is that the default parameters must be only declared once. So you only do it in the declaration. If you implement a function, you don't need to talk about default parameters ever again. It will actually result in an error or C++ will com uh, complain if you do. So this is basically the way to do this. I mean, here our function is of course empty and, and this is just for illustration reasons, but normally here you would implement the actual function and define it, but here you don't need to uh, tell uh, C++ what the default values of each of the arguments is. Okay? Here are a couple of um, uh, um, attributes that you can also add. Oh, sorry, there's another question in the back. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, those go hand in hand. Um, but this is like yet another tool for you to make sure that the user is only able to do certain things, right? Because when the user calls a function, those parameters always will have a type. That's a nice thing about a type language here. They have always a type. And sure, they might be converted, but if you're explicitly, explicitly saying here for that type, it's wrong to do that, that would be something that is even more helpful when you use that function, or when others are going to use your function in that case, right? Well, is there any need to uh, go around that because that's explicit, because there's this kind of like equivalent that you want to like, um, use that Well, the, 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 the function declaration is already giving you the exact type that you're expecting, right? Everything else is already giving you a lot of leeway um, and, and that you know, might go wrong eventually. So hopefully whenever you create a function and people will have to use your function, you hope that they will always use that particular type, right? That is what you hope. This is a way to make sure, to make explicitly sure that they definitely don't use other particular types. That's, that's how you should see the delete keyword here. Okay? If not, just ask later again when uh, the, the question is still not answered properly. Yeah. Okay, we were here with the function attributes. So also these are helpers uh, or kind of help you in showing things what can be done with a particular function or when it is perhaps dangerous to use a function in one particular way. Uh, so the first one, no return, means here you explicitly tell the compiler um, that your function does not return anything. Um, and that is good because then C++ can optimize for that. Uh, but if you use the function in a way that you think it's going to return something, you assign, uh, you assign something to your variable that is that function, for instance, then that uh, compiler will know, right? And that is how you can uh, put no return in front of your function certain functions in this case. So in this case, uh, this function uh, does not return. Actually, it exits your entire uh, executable in this case. And uh, that's something that we want to know. And therefore, no return is given. Deprecated is something when you have multiple versions, and you always will have multiple versions. Whenever you start coding something, a few weeks, two months later, you've had so many versions already in your GitHub repository, uh, that certain of those functions that you started with of old age will not, will not be used anymore, but then other people might still depend on them. And then to slowly make this process die out, you can then use deprecated to force people to not stop using this. 
This is not something that you will have in very small projects typically, and this is usually you know, looking for a long li a lifespan. But if you're ever in this case, then you can add deprecate it in front of it, also with a string, that's the other option, to give uh, as a feedback. And then when this is happening, when users use that particular function, then this happens to appear uh, as a feedback from the compiler. So if somebody used this old function, then they will say, uh, or they will get a warning of the compiler, and your particular string that you added here will be then given as a warning from the compiler as well. Yes? Yeah, yeah, it can be in in, a, in the line before that. Yes, yes. So it's like we are telling the compiler to do this particular error. Yeah, it's not an error; it's a warning. So basically, people can still use our code and compile with it, but each time they compile it, they will see this warning saying you're using a function that is old, and typically you can also say here. Uh, in one two or two two months, you know, we will start deleting this function and you can't use it anymore, for instance. Right? So that, that would be a way to force your users. So if you're ever lucky enough to code something with thousands of users using your code, then this is the way to communicate them the hard way that you're going to phase out some of those functions. Yes? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. You have to do this for every, f I mean, if you're overloading the multiple functions, then you will have to give for each function declaration, and each of those overloaded functions is a, is a specific function, right? So it's a, uh, so you'll have to do, redo this for everyone. Yeah. Very good question, yeah. And then the last one is uh, no discard. This is a very typical thing. You basically have a function where sometimes from the function signature, users can get a bit confused. Like with get maximum, you probably can't. Um, but maybe you, you sometimes assume that a function changes a value, like you provide an, uh, a value to the function. And later we'll see, it is possible to do this in a way that uh, the value of, of that uh, of what you give here as a, as a variable does get changed. And then when people assume that, uh, that this thing over here gets changed, they might just call that function and never use the return value of that function. Right? They use this function like we used in it earlier in our maze example. Right? It's, it's, it's void. Um, if it's returning an integer, the integer is kind of thrown away right? if we call the function that way. And it is possible to do it that way. Well, this is a way to make sure that people get warned that actually the way to use this function is to get a return value, right? Later we'll see you can, have, for instance, um, get an array or a string or an object of a class, and you can put that as an argument of, uh, of a, uh, or as a parameter of a function, and then it might look like it's going to change that object or it's going to change that array because it could. But if your function is written in such a way that it will return something that is, that is being produced by this function, and this is not being changed, then you can use no, disc dis, uh, no discard. Meaning, you should not discard whatever this function is returning because that is the point of this function. This function is using your input or your attributes of the, uh, your parameter of the, uh, of the function. And at the end, it's creating this. And if you're not using this, what it's created, then probably something is wrong. So there, no discard is something that you can use here as a warning to the user that you're probably using this function in the wrong way. Okay? All right, then very quickly, because I need to up the ante a little bit, um, header files and modules. So I'm sure most of you already know that you can split up things in multiple files. Um, and the way to do that is to create modules out of those particular files. And You've, in C++, you just have header files and CPP files. Header files where you kind of declare your functions, as we've just declared them in one line. You basically say what the signature of a function looks like, what its return type is, what the name of the function is, and what the parameters are, perhaps even with uh, attributes, etc. But you know, that is basically what you can define in a header file. And in the CPP file, you actually implement what is happening when you call that function. 
So there you have the curly braces and the block of statements that says what the function actually does. So that's split up into a header file and a CPP file. And then in the end, you have also then usually your main file, which is in a separate CPP file that then calls the header file of your module. And you just to illustrate that, as I think the easiest way to show that is to again go to our main, uh, to our uh, maze um, example. And here I won't do it in, in, in coding, but I'll just show you how it's split up. Here we have our uh, original main function as we had it. But now this is the only thing in our file. So in our file, we just have our main function and that's it. As you can see, instead of including lots of libraries here, we include just draw maze.h. Right? That is the only thing we do. Um, and then when in our draw maze.h, so note that we have a completely different file over here, we just say what or declare the functions here. So we have three functions, the initialization function, the clear screen function, and the draw function with their particular signatures. And we include over here uh, also the ncurses library. And then in the CPP file, we then include the header file that is uh, attached to it in a way because here for all the functions that we declared in the header file, we now implement those. So for init curses, that's this, for clear screen, it's that, and for drawing, it is that. So we have this dependency between these three files now. Our main function is here. We declare our helper functions for drawing our maze later here, and we implement those functions over here. Right? That's, that's it. That's how those, um, uh, what those files do. And we have this ncurses header file also somewhere in our system uh, for our library of ncurses. Because the ncurses library is just a module like we just now created a module that is called draw maze, right? Except that draw maze is a local one. That's where we have these quotation marks over here. If it's one that is in a standard uh, location where C++ knows where to find it, then we have those uh, smaller than bigger than signs around what we need to include. Okay, so that is something that uh, also makes the compilation a little bit more difficult. You know, up until now I've been compiling with one line and you probably at home as well. Um, but if we now do this for uh, the se separate files, we typically need to compile objects files first for all the things that we want to have as uh, modules. In this case, our draw maze is the module that we have and we just compile it. We don't create our executable. That's why we have the minus C over here. And we still want to use C++11. Uh, and this will create, so this line executing that will create drawmaze.all, which is an object file, which then later can be linked or glued together by our linker. Uh, the same we do for our main function. So our main function is in maze.cpp, and also that we can use, or uh, we can compile into an object file, just the way uh, we did it for draw maze. So now we have two .o files, and those two we need to just link together with the end curses, and that's uh, it. So that's what we do in the third line. So we take the object file of our maze main function, we take the object file of our helper functions that are in draw maze as a module, we output this as an executable called maze, and we link our end curses library with that. So when you're doing this, the G++ compiler and linker will then link these object files together with the ncurses uh, library and everything should work from then on. So that is more or less how that works. If you do things on the lowest level inside uh, or on the command line, and I would uh, um, recommend to do this in the beginning because it shows you how, how the, the steps look like. Because typically in an IDE you can automate all of this and then create really complex things, but things are not so complex in the beginning. So why use modules? I think you know this already. You basically structure this, you have libraries, you don't, uh, you're not concerned about the coding of these modules, you just want to use those files and you want others to reuse this, so basically it's something that is put out that can be used by others. Um, also it can save compilation time because typically those modules already come with their .o file, so be, like the incurses in this case for instance, is then basically immediately taken. You need, don't need to compile this entire thing anymore, you already have um, the object file that's belonged to that, which is already pre-compiled. <clears throat> so you have these dependencies, and with these dependencies, typically when you go to an IDE or you use a make environment, you can use exactly these lines in your make environment to tell a program like make 
how things should be made into one big executable. Because from now on, we can't compile things anymore in one line, typically. I mean, you could, but it's, it's getting a little bit complicated once you start like this. And because of that, we, we have tools to our availability, like CMake or Make in this case, which only depend on a few things that you give it, that you feed it in terms of information. And the pieces of information that you have to give this tool is exactly what you see over here, these dependencies. And these dependencies are basically rules so that Make, the, the, the program Make, knows how to compile everything. So just a very, very, yeah, sorry. The order is important, but the order in which we tell make uh, what uh, the rules are is not important. Yeah, but it's a good point because basically the order in which we type these lines is important. You can't start creating your executable if your object files are not there, for instance. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. But um, we're coming to that. But uh, I like that train of thought because basically everything that such a make utility would need is a file like this, which is usually called makefile. Um, and this makefile is exactly what we saw in the previous slides, right? You have rules that are given a name, and for those rules you have dependencies, those, those things over here that follow uh, the colon over here. And on the next line, indented by a tap, a real tap character that's sometimes very tricky, you then basically have the command that we saw already before. And as you see, I turn it around, I basically said, um, our default rule is called maze, or that's the default rule because it's the first one. So if I type make, then it will first create this thing over here, maze. And that depends on draw maze.o and maze.o. So it knows, okay, now I have to go and look for those rules. So maze.o is over here, draw maze.o is over here. So it will then execute these after it has looked at these dependencies, and these dependencies mean um, make sure that these files are there, right? So if these files are there, then we can start executing this line over here. Is this, if these two lines are there, then we can start executing this line over here. And once we have executed those two rules, we are now uh, have accomplished everything for our maze rule, and now we execute this line over here. Right? It's very simple. You have basically dependencies act as rules, um, that, that depend on certain things, either files being there or other rules, and those other rules you can basically define by yourself. And those are just commands that you would have typed in the console, right, as we just did. So that is everything that you need to know. And in most environments, make is already installed, otherwise you can easily install make. It needs in the same directory as make file, and then you have everything here to your availability. Right? So that is, that is the, nice, the nice thing about this. So let me quickly show this as well. Oh, no, I can't. I don't have, uh, I don't have it here. But anyway, um, I, uh, you have the code. It's also in the GitHub repository. So if you look at it there, you will see also the make file. You will see the, uh, the three source files, so the draw maze.h and .cpp, as well as the maze.cpp. If you um, uh, download those, and if you type make in the command line, then you will see, or it should, immediately look at your make file and then automatically execute the right uh, commands. And of course, you, can, you don't need only one command. Instead of saying g++ draw maze.o, you could also add here multiple ones that, uh, uh, that are removed. So basically, if you want to, for instance, first make sure that all object files are removed, you can start this with um, uh, deleting all the object files, for instance, and then executing the compiler. Or you can use that as an extra rule, where, for instance, clean is typically used for that, to remove all the files that are kind of helper files before you start um, building your executable from scratch. So that is the essence of a make file, and that is typically how people then create bigger projects, where dependencies between multiple files then start to become important. Because you need to, for every module that you create, first compile this, and then afterwards, when you've compiled everything, you need to build uh, everything together by linking it. So to summarize, that's what functions are. Now let's go and, um, and still try to get the best or the most out of the arrays. So also for arrays, you have uh, um, uh, important things. Um, 
basically arrays are a type or b are based on the types that we've already seen. And we've seen already multiple types. We know that a type is uh, used by the compiler to make sure how that memory space is being managed, what operators can be used, and how much, uh, how much uh, this footprint is. So basically, if you have uh, um, variables of type int, you know that these are a particular number of bytes, in this case four, that they are organized in a way that it can hold the number from minus, in this case two, to two billion, um, and that you can multiply these integers. So that is what you know when you, uh, when you have the type integer for a particular variable. An array is a shortcut to make sure that if you have multiple of these integers, like hundreds of those, that you don't need to do this one after the other, that you can save space by saying, I want hundreds of those. And that is, in many cases, a lot more efficient. Uh, and that is, the efficiency is actually why arrays initially were conceived. So an array is basically just a number of those uh, variables of the same type. So if I have, um, in this case, float my area seven, then I have seven floats, uh, and I put them into a structure that I call my array. And I can uh, get to each of those floats with the index over here. Um, the tricky thing is that the index starts from zero, so I can only get to those uh, values by saying uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, if this array is of size seven, right? And that's where novices usually make a lot of mistakes because if you create an array of size seven, then you can go only to, uh, then you can iterate until six. But that is normally not that much of a problem. So it's basically the way it says here, my array zero is the first element and has four bytes and is a float. The last element is my array six, is the seventh element of our my array and has also four bytes and is also a float. Okay, um, you can initialize your arrays by saying this is the type of my array, this is my, the name of my array, and I don't have to, if you initialize them immediately, create even the, the length of your array. You just have to say this is an array by having those square braces, and then you assign this or initialize this to this particular array with the curly braces. All right, so in this case, my array is of size four. That means you can uh, get to those values by saying my array zero, my array one, my array two, or my array three. Uh, and then you'll get these four values, right? That's, that's how you get to the array. You can get the size of this array. The tricky bit here is that it's a very old-fashioned C uh, construct, which gives you this size in bytes, because that's what typically programmers in the days were very interested in. If you want the actual number of elements of your array, you still have to divide by the size of your first element, typically, right? So if you have the size of your entire array in bytes, divided by the size of the first element in bytes, then you have the number of elements in your array. Um, and then, um, yeah, typically this is where you need loops, right? To go over an entire array and do something for the entire array. For instance, to put all the elements of one particular array of 400 booleans all to false. Here's an example um, that I think is illustrative enough. So basically you could create with an array a 3D vector, right? So you have a vector of three doubles, you assign those uh, initial three components, uh, initial values, or you could shorten this with uh, directly assigning this to um, a constant array over here, which is basically, this is a constant array of, um, of doubles, as you can see here, those are the constants. And you can then reassign a particular components or read them out. Huh? Now important is that depending on the compiler, um, and most compilers allow this, you can actually as, uh, access uh, arrays or array elements beyond the boundaries. So you could just, if this is a four, uh, a four uh, an array of size four, then you could go uh, and access the fifth element, which of course is never initialized over here, um, but, in, but it would work. And basically in that case, you would be able theoretically to access parts of your memory that belong to other variables or even other processes, depending on how your memory is managed. So here you have an array of four integers, then you have a fifth integer as a variable over here, then this memory might look like this. So the first four uh, integers over here belong to our array, but then my integer, which is a completely different thing, a completely co different construct comes after that, could perhaps be accessed by saying my array four, right? So 
my array 0, 1, 2, 3, and my array 4, in that case, will read my integer. That is the reason why people tend to say that C++ is very unsafe. And they would be right. You know, basically, this makes things very difficult or also very dangerous. Um, and it means that the programmer has a lot of responsibility to make sure that this does not happen. Right? And that's, that is absolutely the case. There are programming languages that, uh, that go about this. Um, but also there, other things, other problems could happen in terms of security. <clears throat> Here's a couple of examples, and those are the examples, again, that I would like you to do at home um, or in uh, the next two hours in our exercise session after the, the um, in-class uh, assignments. You basically have here a very simple example. Um, that's something that uh, you can do at home. This is a little bit more difficult, and this is then, I think, a little bit more gratifying because here you start getting a little bit nicer, nicer output. So here you basically have, or you're asked, to create um, using the random function from this uh, random um, module um, to create a histogram out of random values that you get. So you could basically fill an array with random values and then create um, in a t console still something like this because you can use certain, um, uh, certain uh, encodings to create these most consoles, right? And that's something that you can then uh, try by yourself. It is not too difficult. I would say difficulty level three is where we are at, right? So that's something that you should definitely be able to do. Now, when we have an array, we can, of course, also have multidimensional arrays. And for multidimensional arrays, you can basically say that these are arrays nested in other arrays. So arrays of arrays of arrays of arrays are possible. So in, in case of a two-dimensional array, it is basically an array of two arrays that are each four long. So this is, in this case, a two-dimensional array where the first dimension is uh, of size two, the second dimension is of size four. Unlike other programming languages like Java, in this case, you need to stick to those dimensions when you, for instance, assign the values to this array, to this two-dimensional array. Um, that is very important. In Java, you could, for instance, here then put a, an array of three or an array of two in this case. Um, that is not possible in C++. You have a grid, and you need to fill that grid, basically. Um, and then if you initialize multidimensional arrays, of course, you need to nest four loops. I think that goes without saying. I mean, here is basically an example of how this would be done. And also there, you could use size of, which again returns the bytes that are uh, that are taken by the entire thing that you're asking the size of. So if you're asking the size of the entire table, then it will give the table of the entire grid, the two-dimensional array that you have. And in this case, the first element of my table, if you consider this as a one-dimensional array, will be this first array, right? This first thing over here. So it won't be four bytes, it will be actually four plus four plus four plus four, or four times four is 16 bytes. Right? Yeah. yeah. And here is then also again for home, the next version of our maze game where we want to actually create the maze. You know, we already now have a player that couldn't go around. We just want to have the map. How do we create a map? With a multidimensional array, right? It's basically a bitmap. Um, so we have here um, an array of integers. These are basically integers, the zero and ones. You can also make those bools, perhaps. Um, but uh, that is our maze. We could draw here basically what our maze looks like. And you can use this maze as uh, something that you draw then on the background. And then on top of that, you draw the user. And then you can then check whether the user bumps in the maze or not. Bumping means as soon as you move the user, you have to say, see whether you want, where, where you want to use the, uh, move the user to, whether there is a one there or not. So one is a wall, a zero is where the user can walk, right? That's, that's basically the concept of this maze. And I actually have this, um, no, I will get this in uh, the GitHub repository so you can check how I solved it. So that would be um, the, the, the maze game. Then I am running slowly out of time. Um, strings are basically arrays in C++ um, and are in, in many other languages as well. So basically a string is an array of characters. Um, and uh, in this case, or you could do this in multiple ways in C++, the most primitive way to actually have an array of characters. Important here is that usually when you create a string the old-fashioned way, or the not so 
uh, new way is that your string always ends with uh, the zero character. So again, from the earlier remark, this is not an empty space. This is the actual character that is at space zero in the ASCII table, uh, or that you can um, define like this, right? So if you have strings or nothing else, then a, an array of characters. Um, and we can also there have a way to initialize a string straight away. So in this case, we have an array, and instead of having to painstakingly um, initialize each of those characters of our arrays in a for loop or in other way, in, in uh, manually, we can do this in one go because we already have this construct here that says this is a constant string over here, and a constant string is exactly an array of characters where the last character is the zero. Right? All right, so that's, and this is something that you can use or that we have been using already with our um, console output objects uh, that we have seen already quite a few times. And therefore, whenever we have an empty string, an empty string is not really an empty string, it still has one character, namely the zero character. But somebody already told, me, uh, told us that before. Okay, here's a couple of examples. Um, uh, what can be happening uh, or what you can do uh, for instance, for concatenating strings, I, w I would think it's a very nice homework to just try this out in the old-fashioned way. So by, by just looking at them as a, a character of arrays, try to concatenate these two strings or th these two arrays of characters. It's not that easy, or it's, it's easy, but it's, it's actually quite convoluted. But of course, for that, we have uh, helper functions that will come in a way. An uh, important thing is that whenever you pass an array as an, uh, as an argument or as a parameter of a function, then we pass by reference. What that means we'll see in a, uh, in a later chapter, I think next week or the week after it, when we really go into, into pointers. But basically this means if we pass this A array over here to the function and we swap two elements, as we've seen earlier, swapping elements works, then actually those elements will have been swapped. Because if you pass these two elements and their indices uh, to this uh, function, then this function will actually change this actual parameter. And the reason is that an array is like a pointer, uh, as we see, or as a reference, as we see later. So this is uh, the difference between uh, call by value. Here we have something different. We have call by reference. And later when we'll see the lambda function, we'll see that we can actually, for the lambda functions, specify what we can do for each and every parameter in our function. Um, this would be the way to read characters from your terminal, because up until now, when we try our, in our examples, to read strings from the terminal, things might not work. For instance, if you have a space, in what, if you're typing a sentence, then actual words are being captured, but not the spaces. So the way to do that is uh, shown over here. That is just for your information when you do something at home. That is a typical question that we tend to get in that case. And then now I'm giving you uh, finally then still a preview of what is to come, but uh, only the preview. So basically the uh, lambda function is something you might already know. A lambda function is a function that does not have a name uh, that you can pass to another function and then that function basically executes that function for you. And that is happening a lot later when we'll see templates and particular libraries. And for a lambda function in C++, starting from the standard 11, we'll see that this is the way you create a lambda function. Or without the auto x equals, you basically have this as something that you can pass immediately to a function call. So when you have a function call and a function expects from you to uh, have a function as a parameter, which is possible, why we'll see it later as well, then this is the way to do that. This square braces is what I just quickly already gave you a hint about. Here you can tell which of those parameters are called by value or called by reference or anything else. So that's something we don't use yet. Um, here you have your parameters of your function. Note that there is no name. And then here you basically have, between the curly braces, the body of our function, which can, which can have many statements, which is basically what your function does, right? Using those particular parameters. And if it has a return type, we basically uh, notice like this, with the arrow and then the return type of that function. So this allows us to create a function that we can immediately, an, an anonymous function, we don't have a name here, that we can immediately pass to our uh, function, for instance. 
as a function call. And then later we'll start using this uh, more and more, this lambda expression. Um, here's a very quick uh, preview of why we're using, uh, or why we could use lambdas right now. Um, and this is something, okay, I'm going to uh, show this already, even though I still have three minutes, uh, only three minutes. So if you have an array already, this is, for instance, uh, one way what, what you could do with a particular array. So we have an array of a series of numbers here. We have a different type of for loop uh, since C++11, uh, which can basically go over the entire array. So here we don't need to say, this is our iterator, and it starts at 0, and it stops at n, and we increment it by 1 each time, for instance. We could do this in one go by saying, here is the construct that we are iterating over. We don't need an iterator here. We just say for our array over here, we do this, right? And that is, that is the, the interesting bit here. So basically we have uh, a value that is taken from our array. That's basically each of those uh, elements in our array. We do this particular thing. So this will be printing out all of these numbers in one for loop without us having to iterate over each and every element. We just do this in one go. This is called a for each loop or range based for loop. And that is a very nice way, I think, to shortly define a for loop. Yes? Um, is, it, is it better to execute? Is it more uh, memory efficient? To, uh, to execute? It does not matter. <laughs> so it is shorter, but usually, I mean, especially in simple things like this, you know, uh, uh, the compiler will probably uh, create exactly the same machine code. Yeah, I would say that this, this does not matter at all. But it's much shorter, of course, and much more intuitive. You basically say, over the entire array, do this, right? As you know from other languages like Python, pro probably already, right? There it's very easy. In C++ starting from 11, this is also quite easy. And later we will see objects and classes that are collections, like a vector or templates. This is also possible. Right, and the same goes uh, for um, another construct. This is also part of our IOS3 module. There we have for each. For each is one of the few things that I can now show already as a kind of a preview of what can be done. Um, so for each is a function that you can call. And this function needs the beginning of a particular construct, like the beginning of your array and the end of your array. Similar to the for loop that needs the beginning and the end of your array, but it's in a nicer way, but then for each element of your array, you can then immediately map this to a function. And that's where we, for instance, can use a lambda function in this case. So in this case, we give our lambda function straight to the for each call over here, and then for each function, we'll execute this function for each element in our array. So it will print out nicely uh, the h, the e, the l, and the o, and so on, um, with an l in between. I'm not sure why I put the l in between. Let me quickly change this. I think I wanted to have a space in between there. So that a hello is kind of stretched. That's what I wanted to have, right? So this function allows that. And I don't need to give this function a name, and I don't need to declare and then implement this. I can just give the lambda function there, and the lambda function will be given to the function for then executing this for every element of the array, from to. Okay? So that's also to give you kind of already a first glance at things still to come. All right, any question? Yeah, would that work with just standard array? Uh, oh, right, yes. Actually, I would need to indeed uh, say using std uh, begin, uh, using std end. Same for C out and same for end line, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. I, I will change that in the slides because mm -hmm. this, if you copy paste this, you will uh, get from the compiler a hint on how to, s to fix it, but basically you need to um, uh, say what parts of the namespace you did. Okay, perfect. All right. Any other questions? If not, then I would say we take now a 15 minute break before we go into the exercise sessions. And as I already said, the first thing we'll start doing is handing out papers and you will need to show us how good you are at programming for loops, okay? So quarter past, we come back, and then we'll do the exercises. Thank you very much for your attention.